Hello everybody and thank you for joining tonight. This is your host Nino and we shall be having another book review on Call of the Wild. 60s. <laughs> the 60s were indeed quite a wild time in Lisp. And the programming language Lisp, its operation and applications, is one of the most famous and influential books of the early days of Lisp from 1964. And it shows great creativity and enthusiasm over various topics. And some of the ideas are really interesting, whereas others are sheer nonsense. And we shall explore each in turn and see how people were looking at the possibilities Lisp was offering in its earliest days. Already in the beginning, let's go to page 4. The focus was actually on the IBM 1790 computer, as the computer with the large Lisp but there was also a small lisp for the PDP-1 and like over there and that's actually quite quite remarkable because the PDP-1 itself was a comparatively small computer that is if compared to the 7090 which was a mainframe the PDP-1 was arguably a mini computer and it's remarkable that such a thing even existed in the beginning, even more so as the PDP-1 was sometimes used as a sort of auxiliary machine in order to input information into other large systems. But that showed the desire to have an own system to experiment with Lisp already then. And, yeah, as to what Lisp could be used for, well, symbolic calculation, differential and integral calculus, electrical circuit theory, mathematical logic, game playing, and other fields of, and now this is important, intelligent handling of symbols. This is what we nowadays call the symbol grounding hypothesis. That is that you can express intelligence through symbols and the manners in which they interact. This is a mere hypothesis. You cannot possibly prove this. And there are other popular endeavors to create artificial intelligence and, and artificial intelligence applications which do not resort to the symbol grounding hypothesis. Nowadays, most famously, neural networks, but there exist other approaches too. Now, as is outlined on page 10, the handling of spaces here on the IBM 7090 Lisp seems to be quite flexible, whereas in PDP-1 Lisp it seems the system is much more finicky and would only accept that. So I'm just mentioning it in case you decide to experiment given that both the PDP-1 and the IBM 7090 can be emulated nowadays quite easily with sim H, like the simulation historical. So in essence, one can run early lisps even on one's phone and thermux. And indeed, this shall be done on this channel later on. And then there's a little bit of a involved discussion on parentheses opening and closing, you know, which continues here even further, as that was a little bit of a novel way of structuring programs even. Then is mentioned the precedence of t to the truth value and that any sort of true condition needs to have, like any sort of cont needs to have at least one true condition. And this I find actually a quite interesting example with true conditions, both true but the second one will ev evidently never get evaluated because the first one will already assume 
the value true and you will get D and it will never check out what happens with E. This one is interesting though. The computer will evidently not accept nothing being true. So this must be where this tradition comes from, that every cont clause needs to have a T clause in the end. Also, another fun detail, you can quote numbers, but you do not have to. Now it further continues here on page 22, outlining some quirks of the um, PDP-1 as well. And for instance, a Lisp 1.5 was using define in order to put into a list several function definitions, like more than one. Whereas the PDP-1 was not doing the same, and it was using apparently a DEX device where you could define only one function. The PDP-1 seems to have had a couple of further quirks, like for instance, yeah, here, here by the way you have a very nice example of how to define a square function in Lisp 1.5, how the computer will respond, how to input it into an evil quote, a REPL, and how to use it otherwise in, uh, you know, normal usage internally in programs. And yes, you're having here also a cube function and, and the triple function to show you like different arithmetic functions. So this, these are actually nice examples on how to define stuff in Lisp 1.5, should you be so inclined. Yeah, as to the man mentioned quirks, apparently the PDP-1 does not see minus zero as the same thing as zero. So again, there might be a little bit of quirks introduced by that. And apparently, not all predicates existed everywhere. For instance, they mention here that the PDP-1 list does not have a zero peak predicate, but that you can define it if you are so inclined. By the way, some more modern lisps also didn't have it. And this ek to zero seems to have been necessary elsewhere too. At least I recently discovered that the lisp by Randy Beer from the 1980s, which I once upon a time ported to the TRS-80 Model 100, also doesn't have a zero P predicate and you will have to work with ek to zero. And we can jump on to page 37, as there's actually a very nice outline of append, of the function append. Oh, and, you know, maybe we, should, we might have also a look at how one can define a quotient function, and how Apparently one can keep track of one's parentheses manually. But anyway, what I wanted to show you is how here append is demonstrated actually very nicely. And, you know, it's, it's, it's actually intriguing that the quote is not abbreviated with an apostrophe, but is really written out. And it's actually rather nice guidance on append. And then further on, I've shown also a couple of uh, where are, where is it? Couple of mapping function. I find it a bit unfortunate that it starts with map list because from the mapping functions I don't find that most practical. But yeah, like you repeatedly apply the function to the CDR, to the cutter of the function. Let me see whether this equivalent of mapcar was also mentioned, no. So, 
Yeah. It gives you a short overview of what is possible. And it is actually quite interesting that Lisp is truly allowing things to be computed which which go be beyond mere numeric computation like that you actually can can get expressions and as you have it here that you actually can have expressions and and, and more complex answers than merely numerical data and the goal of the paper to give a general overview on LISP for people who are just starting with it, I think that was reached quite nicely. Now, the next paper starts quite... It, it, it is attempting to short, short, sort of show you a, an introduction to LISP, but it's terrible at that job. It is rather confusing, actually. However, it shows you many interesting details, in particular on the binding of functions and variables, which actually may be of interest, particularly if you are into Lisp internals. Now, it does outline again, um, very simply, you can use spaces or commas to separate things, um, like elements in, like units for the Lisp reader. It shows you rather quickly that a list actually can also be written in this notation. It shows you some rather fast examples and and some like like this typical box structures and how things are built up, and you can have more complex structures that way. It very quickly gives you a bit of an introduction to recursion and mentions that a recursion is a natural way of handling things in Lisp. You, you have it here. Lisp is so arranged that recursive functions are admissible. It has functions that use themselves in the evaluation process. That's a very concise and nice definition. And this is a very powerful feature, and recursive coding in Lisp is a frequent occurrence. So, if you wonder why this fond waxing about recursion happens basically in every early Lisp paper, it's because early Fortran apparently was not capable of it. So they are saying, now we have a language which, which totally can do that. Then, in passing is mentioned... I find that quite nice, actually, that null can be seen as a special case of ek. And afterwards truly comes the part on which this paper is focusing, namely variable bindings. And how variables are bound on an A-list, and so on and so forth. And what is interesting is that they mention here that the that there is a binding possible according to a symbol's p list and also according to this a list and that the p list binding is being sought first and that the a list binding is intended for more short ter short term bindings whereas the p list binding is intended for longer term bindings and that therefore a P-list binding will overrule such an A-list binding. Well, that's the way I understood it at least. And on the next page, he continues to mention that variables are bound to the A-list, whereas functions are bound to the P-list. So, yeah. This was all in the beginning a little bit of a mess, the whole variable binding thing, including the fact that the compiler was apparently working 
somewhat differently than the interpreter. And here they also give you a bit of details of how you will get an error if it's not found anywhere on the A-list. So this is a little bit of a mess how exactly the variable bindings are happening and sort of a topic throughout the book. Then comes a section on how to define functions including a very nice diagram on how define was operating in the beginning. So that's what it looks like and apparently for the definition of sort of global variables you are using C set. It's also perhaps noteworthy. In particular because apparently C set is creating a binding on the property list of some symbol and therefore a binding on the A list which is sought only after the P list is being checked cannot overrule it. And they mention here this is being used in order to define truth and falsity, like TF and NIL. It's really again funny that they have F and NIL. So this is a bit of a mess where they apparently haven't quite decided yet whether false shall be F or NIL. But, and, and yes, and true is still defined as this T with asterisks. Like nowadays, you don't have that evidently. And it's fun that like common list finally went for T and Neil, whereas scheme actually essentially went for T and F. And then he talks a little bit about eval. And it's really funny because eval on a list really works just like something you can use for interpreter input. Like if you don't want to deal with this evil quote weirdness, you can also just, you know, supply an evil with a list that you would like to have evaluated. And so like you always your first element will be the evil and your second element will be whatever you want to input in, in sort of normal notation. And then in the following pages, he tries to come to explain Fexpers, which were like sort of functional expressions, but it's all extremely confusing and not very well done. And then finally, he arrives at the use of mapping functions like map list. Further on, the paper goes on to explaining property lists. And here is an interesting outline all the sorts of properties which apparently uh, an IBM 7090 system is making use of. So you can say that an atom, even an early Lisp, was no simple thing. And here you even have a graphical representation and also this funny mention that numerical atoms always stand for themselves and do not need to be quoted. But he also mentions that arithmetic is not very fast because apparently they had implementation tricks to make the whole thing work. And finally, he sort of mentions here prog and tells you that, you know, using that, maybe you can use it the way um, to do arithmetic as in Algol and Fortran. Now it's quite funny because he mentions that some people see the use of prog somehow as immoral, right? Which is funny. But the reason behind that seems to be that some people really just write, like with the help of go, like go to prog and set Q, basically write Algol or Fortran in Lisp, you know, like the style does not change to anything lispy. And that, of course, shouldn't happen. And then on the next page, 
you see a very nice outline and comparison of how to input things in evil and evil quote. And it is my personal sincere opinion that this madness here, like as if this wasn't complex enough, is one of the things which in the beginning gave Lisp a sort of a bad name somewhat, you know. Not only do you have all sorts of parentheses, which may look a bit intimidating to the novice until you get used to them. No, you even had completely different sets of rules of how to input things. So, from my point of view, this whole eval quote was actually not a very good idea to begin with. And then he finally goes on to mention that compilation and interpretation is apparently treating the variables somewhat differently and that basically this is the biggest issue for for like compiling programs like how the functions and variables will actually be treated and what can be reached from where and so on and so forth and that apparently you needed to declare variables as special sometimes when you want them accessed from the outside and so on and it's interesting to see what other computers are mentioned there which have lisp the ANFSQ32 and the M460 and apparently a proposed system for the CDC 6600 the first two are actually later treated in the book as well now the next paper is simply funny 240 exercises with solutions and it is really just that this entire paper is just a whole list of 240 exercises that's what it is and eventually you get interesting homework which perhaps doesn't even quite fit the structure of the exercises such as writing a differentiation program and everywhere is used this weird m expression notation which nobody uses nowadays and which even at the time was starting to get out of fashion sort of and then finally from page 89 on you're getting the answers to your exercises so so this is really funny if you want to drill on lisp 1.5 who knows maybe that's the right paper for you yeah and then follows actually a rather fun paper on notes on debugging lisp programs where it is mentioned in the introduction already the most frequently occurring errors in lisp are parenthetical errors oh really sherlock but later on he also mentions missing um missing termination conditions anyway then comes a paper advising on the style of programming in lisp and i must say the advice given is of course perennial that a program is something that should be easy to write easy to read and easy to explain to others that that's as applicable then as it is applicable now and what's also interesting is that he warns in particular against the use of special programming tricks that you're fond of he gives like this really fun quote like read over your compositions and when you meet up with a passage which you think is particularly fine strike it out that's something which sometimes is forgotten in particular here i'm looking at c programmers who think that the weirdest briefest strangest construct which is barely intelligible to anybody that that's like somehow a good idea no it's not 
and it wasn't even in the 60s. And the next two papers concern sort of AI experiments, which will maybe start out better than they continue. Techniques using LISP for automatically discovering interesting relations in data. And here, interesting is taken to mean unusual. And I actually find the penguin example the author delivers quite good. That the penguin in Antarctica is not interesting. A penguin in the zoo is not interesting. A zoo in Boston is not interesting. But a penguin in Boston and not in a zoo is, however, somewhat interesting. And then the, uh, the author goes on to focus on number sequences and mentions in particular, I think over here, that the important application is in segmenting sequences, that is separating sequences from one another. And, and in a way, you can see that as a question of pattern recognition, if you will. Like, ultimately, you want, through the segmentation of sequences, to tell that certain groups of numbers belong together, which in turn will allow you to recognize some object, for instance. And the way of doing that is suggested, basically here, by looking at some successor operation, and that the general idea is to be using the differences between such sequences in order to segment. And here, you know, I see a little bit of a approach that is not that novel. Basically, that was the idea of Babbage with the differential engine. You know, the differential engine should also have had the property of trying to figure out whether logarithms were computed correctly or wrongly. And one of the ideas was uh, repeatedly subtracting one value from the next and like increasing the difference. And that way, if you get an in, like strangely large difference between two consecutive logarithms, which doesn't really fit in the other typical differences, then you know that something is likely amiss. So this idea of looking at the difference of sequences in order to find out segments isn't really that novel, actually. Not really unique to Lisp at all. And unfortunately, the conclusion here of the paper, which later goes on to page 120, is basically generate and test. So you're trying to figure out all sorts of sequences and then try to find the shortest generation scheme for a given sequence. Like that's lovely, but it leads straight to a combinatorial explosion. And this is where, in my opinion, such ideas have a tendency to fail in practice, in particular if applied to larger problems. Now, yeah, the next paper actually uses the same idea. So that's really a paper on inductive inference on sequences. And the idea is not only to recognize patterns, but also to predict the next symbol of any given sequence. And that sounds charmingly general, right? And to, you know, find automatic programs which would be generating such a sequence. But once again, this is supposed to work on the difference of sequences. Like, he mentions that on page 131. And that means, in reality, yeah, here, taking the differences. So, in reality, this is basically the same idea. Still, 
the proposed scheme has a little bit of creativity to it in that basically this system was supposed to find uh, rules and exceptions that is not insisting on squeezing in every example given as a given in a sequence but to say this and this rule applies in general and these and these cases are special and that way basically the system is searching for best paths and like best sequence patterns again though I see this as clearly under the threat of a combinatorial explosion so in essence these two papers can be classified as belonging to these early efforts of finding out what one can do with Lisp but perhaps not yet as practically oriented in particular towards bigger problems as later expectations towards AI would have it now the next paper is actually quite interesting it concerns one of the early fortes of Lisp namely the application of Lisp to checking mathematical proofs and the authors actually mention that they have been using it in order to um, check certain statements of Russell's and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica and even discovered some gaps in the proofs therein like they mentioned that over here and of course in order to do the proof though it doesn't work on the sheer text but first needs a formalization of the problem in a form acceptable to the system as to how things are working apparently first the problem is being decomposed into a sequence of steps and each step being proven it turns it into a line of proof as they call it so like a part of the problem which has been proven and then apparently symbolic substitution is being used together with inference rules in order to like creep forward with the proof and this until eventually basically everything has been substituted to to to, to true like and and when that occurs when the substitution to true has occurred then the proof has been achieved and the mathematical theorem has been proven and in essence they also mention that they see parallels actually between this proof checker operation and automatic programming you can actually if you will see a parallel to how prolog is actually working you know where you're having certain inference rules and then a declarative style of stating your problem and then Prolog will just figure out how it is solved it's like my opinion on it at least what is also interesting is that apparently the program contained a form of caging mm -hmm. called key lines that is if some proof is observed like more than once then it will be sort of caging and uh, will be sort of caged and can be then used later on in, in a faster matching fashion and would not need to be proven step by step once again and while this all is very creative actually and I think that is certainly one of their more successful early experiments they do also well complain about the excessive storage requirements so like the rate at which Lisp consumes free storage and so on I mean 
looking at an IBM 7090, I can totally imagine that storage was an issue. But perhaps the issue is deeper in that such exhaustive searches and and like basically the way to approach this problem itself is simply prone to reach once again a problem of combinatorial explosion of many different ways of how to handle the issue and therefore really an explosion of search paths towards a solution. And then comes a really funny, quirky and very modestly named program METEOR, a LISP interpreter for string transformations. So he makes actually a reference to COMMIT, a programming language for string processing by Victor Ingve. And essentially, it's an experiment to, to, to transform lists of slag, strings, actually. And the motivation to allow commit-like rules in Lisp, like string transformation such as rearrangement, deletion and insertion really is what we nowadays handle as regular expressions. And it's really funny when he mentions like similarities to commit will be obvious to the knowledgeable reader. Let's say the amount of readers knowledgeable in commit has not exactly increased over time. Some of the things he cares about greatly look a little bit, yeah, like like in 181, 182, the compression, compression and expansion of rules uh, of of strings. This isn't really something we we all that much care about. Like we don't really have that as a regular operation. But here you see basically what it is supposed to be doing. That before the transformation you're having, did he go home today? And after the transformation you're having, he does go home today. And if you have this mindset of 1960s linguistic processing, like natural language processing, then you understand where this is coming from. There were lots of efforts to understand language through regularities. And it actually took apparently a couple of decades for most people to understand that language cannot really that cleanly be squeezed into regularities. So there was one very notable exception from very early on, from the 1950s, who was very clearly telling them that this is nonsense, which is my favorite linguist, Yehoshua Barhilel, who was noticing that language is incredibly metaphorical and breaks all rules. And I really love how he wrote in one of his books that, for instance, a red herring is neither a red nor a fish. And then basically the paper ends with a whole list of quirks and warnings and what can go wrong, where. So, yeah, here, warnings and advice. So, so it's actually apparently quite an experimental endeavor in that direction. But, all in all, a charming effort, in a way. And perhaps also a good example of how the meaning of artificial intelligence continually was switching. Like issues like mathematical proofs, string operations and so on, belong to these early efforts. And nowadays we wouldn't bat an eye and we certainly don't quite see that as artificial intelligence because we regard it as simply too unimpressive. And in a way that is the nature of AI processing, as somebody had remarked, it's the thing we are like sort of not yet capable of doing. Because whatever we become capable of doing, we just like push aside as something normal. Now, the next paper is actually extremely technical. It concerns 
the implementation of Lisp for the M460 computer. Didn't find it all that interesting, to be frank. But you do get a nice memory map of how things were apparently looking there and like what regions were occupied by what. Anyway, again, this paper gives you a good understanding of the technology that was used at the time. Apparently we're talking of some 32,000 words a 30-bit. So that's like 128 kilobyte, like approximately. And which nowadays is truly microcontroller level. The next paper I'm going to show you is uh, somewhat of a mess. Lisp as the language for an incremental computer. And it starts really funnily because they immediately jump for applications for military systems because truly that was where the research money was at the time and actually still is. But while they are criticizing the like common information processing systems at the time, their proposals look rather thin aired like a flexible um, and dynamically changeable computer memory organization and yeah here multiple access time shared interactive computers cannot completely make up for the inadequacies of conventional and list list processing systems and a new basic philosophy is under development for designing automatic information systems to deal with information processes taking place in a changing evolutionary environment. It's like so much hot air you could bake a potato on it. They don't actually say anything very specific of what is wrong with traditional or even Lisp-based information processing. And this new philosophy isn't quite clearly expressed anywhere. They continue to talk about incremental data assimilation from a variable environment. But we still don't know what that is. And they propose some new language which is not Lisp itself but a language that is patterned on Lisp. Now whatever that means, right? A slight redemption the whole thing finds in that apparently they have made experiments in that direction but yeah but nothing further has been much heard of it since so we can conclude maybe having such a pie in the sky idea without any clear definition of what you really want is not exactly doomed to succeed right and in general terms, I see this whole paper as a sort of thing having been born out of the enthusiasm which Lisp presented at the time, without having been thought through all that much in the details yet, though. But, on the other hand, of course, that delivers you a bit of a mental image of the excitement at the time when you could have something else than Fortran or Algo, and no, I don't mean COBOL. And then the next paper is actually quite technical again. It concerns the Lisp system for the ANFSQ32 computer, which, you know, had apparently 64k of storage of 48-bit words. So that's like a very early MS-DOS computer in comparison. What is interesting is that apparently 
this computer was serviced itself by PDP-1s, apparently as peripheral machines, which, as mentioned, had their own lisp. Perhaps noteworthy is, yeah, like, to show, for instance, how they were handling variables which should be available globally. You should declare them special. And the binding again can be established by CSAT. The paper goes on to say that atoms could only be numeric or literal and that octal numbers were having this appended Q to them. As you can see actually, early Lisp used to be quite a simple system, like you didn't have this plethora of data types. And the rest of the paper is actually very technical, but it's perhaps a bit funny how he describes how the printing is going and apparently basically a print is composed out of outputting every element and then in the end putting a terpri. Here he also describes how garbage collection is working and in essence you can actually compare it to this disk defragmentation program in DOS, if you remember, like how it was ordering things. So that, that seems pretty much how you can imagine garbage collection on these earlier machines. Whereby he also mentions that the process is a lot slower than on the IBM 7090, because the ANFSQ32 had a lot more storage. So, not just 30,000 words, but like 64,000, or 65,000, like 64K. And now let us progress to what in my eyes is like the worst paper in the book, and which is like unintentionally extremely funny because he's trying to replace the parenthesis of which he is so much complaining in Lisp essentially with a COBOL like notation which looks like born out of a nightmare. So while whining about parenthesis and prefix notation, something actually a programmer really quickly gets used to, this is what he envisions that maybe Lisp should more properly look like. I mean, this is ridiculous. And apparently he has created some form of translator to, to, to like some, some sort of electronical shape or program of, of this abysmal idea, which we have never really heard of since. And that's really of no surprise. And then the book finally concludes with appendices and listing actually some of the programs. In particular, you will find here Meteor and also the sequence, um, sequence comparison programs. In conclusion, I found that an actually quite refreshing book because it was not just formally describing Lisp as most other books, but showing you a little bit about their mindset, like about the way these people were thinking about it and about the issues they were having, as in where can you run it, on what sort of computer, what could you perhaps do with it, what can you prove, what can you try out. And as I said initially, some ideas awesome, other ideas abysmal, and all in all, you can see a book full of enthusiasm, which I think is quite enjoyable to the reader, in particular if you already know Lisp, actually. 
amusing in a lot of ways and yes I can recommend this clearly so thank you very much for joining tonight's episode I hope you will become a regular viewers and I would be very happy to greet you here again from me have a wonderful evening see you and goodbye <laughs>